needed the Zoom link again, Alvin, so I sent it. Awesome. So I know we've had quite Sounds a few meetings, so. Sounds good, that, that, that works great. So let's do that. Um, uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. And thank you, Nevada Housing Coalition, for hosting the 2020 Nevada Housing Summit. Um, this summit is right on time. You know, we have all been impacted by the effects of COVID-19 in our personal and professional lives. Um, and it's important that we recognize that. And it's also important that we use this session to bring awareness and insight regarding affordable housing for Nevadans. Uh, the goal of this session is, is really twofold. First, we want to provide you information and education on affordable home ownership and housing trends today, and also offer perspective. We want to make sure to offer perspective on how to move forward toward a successful and equitable recovery, housing recovery. My name is Alvin Odom, and I am a senior manager with Charles Schwab Bank in our diverse markets department. And I'm very excited to serve as the moderator for today's session, which is entitled Affordable Housing is More Than a Rental. Uh, before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. And if you don't mind, Christine, let's pull up the housekeeping slide, which we have here. Um, as you all can see here, it's obviously a Zoom meeting. Uh, we're going to ask that everyone kind of keep themselves muted um, at all times. Uh, if you need assistance, please use the chat. And also feel free to uh, keep your video on. If we find that more people come on affecting bandwidth, then we'll probably get a message to, to take video off. But for now, we're good to go. Um, Christine mentioned this before, you may want to use uh, the pin feature in terms of pinning the panelists so they are always on your screen for easy viewing. And also please use the chat uh, for uh, questions and other relative content. Uh, we're gonna make sure to carve out some time before we end to take those questions that are in the chat, any questions that you may have if you come off mute. Also, we're gonna ask that you uh, use your smartphone. We don't ask that typically in meetings today, right? But we're gonna ask that you use your smartphone, that's okay, in order to participate in some live polling. And so you also know the session today is, is being recorded. So uh, before I introduce our esteemed panel, I'd like for us to, uh, to get some engagement and, and pose a couple of those live poll questions uh, that we discussed before. So Christine, looks like you're pulling up those, those poll questions there. So the first poll question is, what professional sector best describes you or your business or organization? Christine, if you don't mind, uh, maybe giving some instructions in terms of how to complete the poll. Yes, and I also got some good cheerleading to get you all to answer. So the easiest way is to use your smartphone. If you take your smartphone and turn your camera on, you can just capture that QR code. Oh, I see some professionals on here. And click on the link that comes up and please respond. And uh, it's kind of a little warm up, but it also gives Alvin and our panelists an idea of who's on and in the session today. I see we have 49 signed up. I am going to respond myself because I'm also listening. Awesome. So go ahead and respond. We're not gonna take too long, but I do wanna see some good responses here because this is gonna warm us up for the next question. And on the next question, it's kind of a fun one and you'll all get to see those results as well. So we're at 49 participants. If you keep your phones open, you'll see the next question just pops up. So it makes it really easy. You can navigate to slido.com, but for those of you that might be worried about losing the Zoom, don't do that. Also, um, if you'd like to just put your name and information in the chat, you may, but this does capture it a little easier for the um, for us to see. Great, I'm gonna give it 10 more seconds. And we're gonna move to the next question. Okay, Alvin, I'll let you. If you'd like to read the next question. All right. So in one or two words only, uh, please name the biggest challenge Nevada faces for this topic. And again, um, this is related to affordable home ownership. So I know we've got different industries represented, folks from different sectors. Again, one or two words only, um, the biggest challenge is uh, for Nevada as it relates to affordable home ownership. And we can just give this a minute. All 
All right, I see we're almost up to as many responses. Alvin, are you ready for me to turn the page? Yeah, let's go ahead and, and turn the page. All right, here we go. So this one's fun, it captures it in a word cloud. This is great. So the biggest challenge. I Oops, Christine, I think we lost the word cloud. Yep, sorry about that. There we go. This is great. This is some, some great thoughts, down payment, affordability, inventory, or big COVID. It's really good to see a lot of the responses that we're seeing here. I, I can tell you that um, I'm looking forward to our panelists. A lot of them will be touching on some of the things that we uh, are seeing right here. So this is, this is fantastic. And it's also great that the audience today is engaged. That's always good to see. Thank you all so much. Okay, and with that said, um, if you would please just allow me to introduce our esteemed panel today. And uh, if you don't mind, I will read their, their short bio, uh, beginning with uh, my friend, Dr. Vivek Saul. Uh, Dr. Saul is the director of the LEAD Center for Real Estate in the LEAD Business School at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. At UNLV, he is responsible for leading the center's efforts in real estate related education, research, policy making and industry outreach. Dr. Saul, thanks so much for joining us today. Ms. Shante Patton. Absolutely, thank you. Ms. Shante Patton. Shante has been a real estate broker salesperson for 16 years in Las Vegas. She's a branch manager of NID Southern Nevada, which is a HUD counseling agency focused on promoting community development. She is also the 2020 Region 15 Regional Vice President for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Shante, thanks for joining us. I look forward to learning more about NARED. Ms. Nia Germa. Nia Germa has represented the uh, State of Nevada Housing Division as its home buyer program specialist for the past three years, where she brings more than 15 years of lending experience in both sales and servicing. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Xavier University of Louisiana. When she's not providing training and support to lender and real estate partners or leading outreach efforts to potential home buyers, she enjoys spending quality time with her husband and their two active boys. Mia, thank you so much for joining us. Diane Arvizo, Diane is a country girl at heart, raised on a Southern California dairy farm. Diane not only embodies the work ethic and values of small town America, she is committed to supporting the rural lifestyle through her leadership of the Home at Last homeownership programs for the Nevada Rural Housing Authority or NRHA. Diane joined NRHA as Director of Home Ownership Programs in 2015 after serving as a Single Family Housing Specialist at USDA Rural Development. Diane, thanks so much for joining us. Mr. John Roussel. John has been a mortgage lender in Nevada since 1997. He has successfully assisted over 4,200 Nevadans in their pursuit of home ownership. He has extensive experience and expertise in the State of Nevada First Time Home Buyers Program Availability and regulations. John has enjoyed helping Nevada obtain the dream of home ownership for almost a quarter of a century. Uh, he does this for the love of this community. John, thank you so much for, for joining us. And last but not least, uh, our good friend at Federal Home Loan Bank San Francisco, Ms. Iris Tam Bailey. Ms. Bailey is the Community Lending Director for the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. She administers the bank's affordable home ownership programs, WISH and IDEA or IDEA, which provide matching grants to low and moderate income households for down payment and closing cost assistance. Prior to joining the bank 13 years ago, Ms. Bailey managed to manage underwriting and compliance functions at independent mortgage banking firms. She was responsible for interpreting, training, and implementing investors mortgage underwriting and post-closing delivery guidelines. So again, such an esteemed panel with us today. Thank you all for joining us. And, and to kick us off, I'd like to first go to Dr. Saw. Uh, again, to kick things off, Dr. Saw, um, please share with us, if you will, just um, the trends that you are seeing in Nevada real estate, um, related to the market, related to housing, economic indicators, um, and affordability. Dr. Saw? Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me uh, for this invitation. I'm really excited to be here and um, share some of uh, some, some data on what's going on um, in the housing market here. 
Uh, I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. clear. I've been tasked to uh, talk about uh, the housing market, which usually I do for an hour, um, but in condense that into five or six minutes, so I'll try my best. Um, these slides are available, so um, there are certain slides that I'll skip over, um, but uh, they're available for you for all the, uh, all the participants. Um, so what I'm gonna start with is talk about what's happening in the housing market, what the price trends, and everything I talk about is going to be over a period of time, so basically we're gonna see where we, where we are in reference to where we were. So some of the, uh, some of the data goes back all the way to 2006, um, uh, which was the start of the, I would say, the, the, the boom in the housing market and then the collapse and then the recovery and then where we are uh, just before um, COVID hit. So um, it gives you a context, gives you uh, a reference because we were kind of the poster child of the housing market crash uh, in the nation and how we have recovered both in terms of uh, price but also in terms of the economy. So everything is relative to economy. The housing market is dependent on the economy. So it's important to think about where we are, what are the economic indicators, what is the local, local economic base looks like today uh, and what is leading to that, um, you know, uh, the, the diversity in the economic base. So we'll start by, um, um, can I move the slide or is it, uh, okay, all right, how does the housing yep. market, so um, uh, uh, can we, uh, can I move the slide or somebody else has to do that? Uh, Christine, if you don't mind, okay. uh, that's all just letting her know in advance. Okay. All right. So again, this is, um, you know, if you look at the, this trend, it's kind of basically, uh, if you go back to 2006, we peaked in November 2006 of 84,000. This is uh, Las Vegas existing single home price trend. So right now, as of uh, September, which for which we have the latest data, we are at 403,000. We've already exceeded uh, that peak that we hit in, hit, hit in 2006. And uh, we've been in the last four years, five years, we've been growing at 10%, which was kind of pretty abnormal. We were one of the fastest or highest growing, uh, fastest growing markets in the nation um, for, for uh, cities that are over a million in terms of population. So it is abnormal growth. And part of that was uh, because there was so much demand, but also because our base was low. We hit a very low uh, base in 2000. 10, 11. So relative to that, our growth has been kind of very uh, exponential. Typically, just to give you, um, you know, context, uh, housing markets, uh, normal average is 2%. We have been exceeding that five times, that 10% since 2013, so, which is very, very, very abnormal. And that's why, you know, um, it brings into the question, are we uh, less affordable now than we are were a few years back? Next slide. Uh, good thing is that the interest rates have been, as prices have been going up, the interest rates have been dropping to the lowest level that we have ever seen in our history uh, nationwide. So we're talking about 2.89, which is what I would call as free money. All right. The only problem over here is although pri although this uh, uh, interest rates are low, um, uh, how many of us can afford uh, based on uh, what's happening in the valley, uh, in the nation, but in more in, in, in the valley, uh, especially in Southern Nevada and how many of us can qualify, which I'm sure some of the lenders in the panel will be able to kind of uh, shed some light on. So interest rates are low. It, they will continue to be low for, I would say, at least a year and a half, year and a half to two years uh, as we come back, come out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, that's what the Federal Reserve ha is planning to do. So people can definitely take advantage of these low rates, to either refinance or to be able to um, go from uh, being renter, renters um, to um, home ownership. Next one. So moving from uh, home ownership, uh, shed some light on rents. As you can see, rents over here have been abnormal as well, uh, growing at 6.5%. Typically, they grow at 2%, uh, but we are three times of inflation, which is what the 2% number comes from. Close to an average uh, um, right now around eleven $1 hundred dollars uh, as of the last quarter, uh, which again we don't uh, you know we don't have the Pacific view uh, that um, San Diego or some of the coastal markets have uh, for, for that eleven $1 hundred is a lot of a uh, lot of money and that's partly due to uh, the growth in um, population the growth in jobs that we have seen which kind of goes in uh, which kind of 
uh, gets us into our next uh, section, which is economic uh, ec indicators. So next one, please. Uh, so the economic indicators, we'll spend some time talking about what's happening to the local economy. And again, I'm spending some time more mostly on the Southern Nevada, Northern Nevada, uh, which is typically Washoe County, uh, Carson City, uh, Reno, is largely driven by tech. Uh, we are here largely driven by gaming and hospitality and a little bit more diversification that we are seeing due to uh, manufacturing distribution hubs and um, a uh, little bit of technology that we are seeing uh, in the last few years, but our bread and butter is uh, gaming and hospitality. So as you can see, the the, the Las Vegas uh, weekly earnings they've, they've jumped up. Uh, so that's uh, you know that's that's good news. Um, so uh, that's positive. That's why you have the thumbs up smiley over there. Uh, next one, please. <sighs> And as far as uh, non-farm employment goes, you know, we have seen some steady growth all the way till, you know, till COVID hit. So you can see that trajectory was going upwards till we dropped down sharply in 2020, where our unemployment rate was uh, as, as high as 30% in, um, in around July. And there were a lot of uh, layoffs and furloughs. And then we have recovered a little bit as the jobs have come back. So we are close to around 15%, which is still much, much higher than the nation uh, in, in Southern Nevada. Next one. Uh, so this, like I said, the unemployment rate was very high as you see it peaked somewhere in you know, June, July, uh, going up all the way to 30%. And now, uh, you know, a lot of that, the jobs have come back as the casinos and the, on the gaming and hospitality have started to work at open and I'm working at 50% occupancy. So it dropped down to 15%, um, but again, there, there's still a long way uh, uh, you know, to recover if we have to go back to some of those lows, uh, which was around 4.5%. Um, I'm gonna skip over here. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how diversified, the most important thing, the resiliency of the housing market, the resiliency of afford you know of, of people being able to uh, move from renters to being a uh, to homeowners depends upon how resilient the local economy is so if you look at you know how we are right now so uh, we are relatively much better as 2000 uh, as compared to 2008 2009 uh, we were much more uh, re reliant on uh, gaming hospital which are still we are so directly and indirectly we are between 40 to 50 percent reliant on that but the pool has become much bigger the pie has become much bigger, but also in terms of the sectors, they are a little bit more diverse. They're not as much as we would like to, hopefully in the next 10 years we can achieve that, but we are adding jobs that are outside gaming and hospitality, like manufacturing, like distribution of data centers, uh, uh, healthcare specifically with the, uh, with the medical sector, you know, so they're much better than what we are uh, 10 years ago. So that's a very important question where people ask is how are we relative to the 2008, 2009 crash? And the answer to that uh, is that we are much better, much more comfortable position as compared to what we were, um, uh, you know, almost 10 years ago. Next one. Um, so this is again, some population to, you know, change, uh, you know, as you can see the red says that we have certain areas, uh, zip codes uh, in um, Southern Nevada have seen, uh, you know, greater than 25% population change in the last seven to eight years, just gives you an idea. Where, which part of the city is growing. Um, so where are the people, so we've seen a big in-migration from a lot of state, particularly California. Um, so this gives you a breakdown on where people are moving, or what is the demographics or specific age demographics of that people are moving in. So the good news is there are a lot of people who are not moving here just to retire. There are 20% almost that are moving here who are retiring, but there's a big chunk, almost 80% that are in that working age of from 19, to, I would say 60, that are moving here largely driven by uh, the jobs that we are creating uh, across the sector, but mainly in uh, gaming and hospitality, but in other sectors as well, which is great news. Next one. Um, so that gives you an idea of where people, like I mentioned, California, but the next one, you know, we have, um, you know, all, all of the states, uh, Texas, uh, and then, you know, a little bit of Florida, and a lot, a lot of that has to do with environmental conditions, uh, you know, the wildfires, of course, the high cost of living over there, but in Texas, you're talking about hurricanes and all that uh, that are affecting 
people's livelihood um, and that's where it's kind of prompting because we have great weather over here we have great airport and then they're creating jobs and that's kind of driving people over here in holds next please um, so which brings us to the question of housing affordability how have we moved in terms of housing affordability just to give an idea in 2012 there was the national association of realtors does a survey or uh, just a evaluation of housing affordability we were uh above both Reno and uh, Southern Nevada or Las Vegas MSA, we were between 20 and 25. Uh, that means we were much affordable way back in 2012. They did that again in 2016, and we were close to top 12 or 13, both Reno and Nevada and Las Vegas uh, in 2016. And if, we, if they were to do that survey in 2000 or that evaluation 2018, 19, uh, we're probably gonna break in top 10, which means we're moving from being very affordable to very unaffordable due to the you know rapid increase in um, home prices and uh, rents, but primarily in home prices, which is largely driven by uh, high cost of labor as well as high um, land prices. Uh, next slide, please. So this again gives you an idea about where we were. So if you look at 2010, 11, when the markets had crashed, uh, you know just after the great financial crisis, housing affordability was at peak. And then we, we started to go down. And as you can see, 2006, we were very unaffordable. And now we have kind of moved right above the median. Uh, but again, that curve is going down, which means we are becoming more and more unaffordable uh, due to the increase in prices. Next one, please. Uh, this gives you an idea about the average existing single home price to median. So basically, we're looking at how wages have increased or what wages are as compared to uh, you know um, the home price. The red is danger. Basically, it means that it's very unaffordable in those areas as compared to the wages that people or income people earn. Uh, but again, this is for existing. The one that is a little bit more um, you know red or very much more unaffordable is the next slide, which basically talks about uh, how the new home prices have moved. So if you can see that there are more reds and oranges, which means that the new home prices uh, are more unaffordable than existing home prices uh, relative to the income. And these are the basically, uh, you know, and a representation of the whole Southern Nevada uh, because uh, we're talking about uh, wages not growing as much, but the new home prices far exceeding those. And hence the ratio is much, much skewed uh, for this particular uh, segment versus this. So the key takeaways, uh, you know, economic condition improving, which is great news. You know, post before the uh, you know COVID hit in March, we were you know I think we were uh, uh, going to have record numbers of people moving here, record numbers of uh, vis visitation conferences. Uh, that has taken a little bit hit. Hopefully, we'll be we're on our road to recovery. Uh, like I was saying, Nevada's economy is booming for various reasons. Uh, Key things with no state income tax, we are creating jobs in gaming and hospitality, but also other industries, which is making us more resilient. Uh, and I hope this is a small blip, and then we kind of go back to our, you know, pre-COVID uh, trajectory. Um, we are seeing one of the highest levels of uh, in migration, particularly from, uh, um, uh, you know, California, which is good for us because we are still, uh, you know, people who are moving in still have family over there, so they still visit, but they are able to afford much, much more than what they would. So if they were renting over there, they are able to afford over here to buy a home, which is great because home ownership is one of the biggest wealth creator. You can not only uh, create wealth for yourself, but also one of the biggest, uh, I mean, uh, I feel contribution of uh, house uh, home ownership is that you can help your kids go to college without having them to come out of, uh, you know, with um, high education loan. You can borrow cheaply, with your uh, with home equity, uh, home ownership, um, probably three to four percent, as compared to burning them with seventy. So I think that is a bigger driver of, uh, you know, biggest, uh, uh, you know, I would say contribution of home ownership. It's not just not create wealth for yourself, but kids as well. And the last two points, of course, you know, the current low interest rate, which is helping buyers, uh, you know, move transition from being renters to homeowners, uh, which creates that wealth, you know, long term wealth. And um, there are plenty of federal programs out there to take advantage. And I'm sure the panelists over here would shed some light uh, over there. One thing I will definitely say is that in terms of affordability, uh, you know, this, the, the administration, the, the counties, the 
the cities have to do a much uh, a better job in terms of providing more supply. And part of the uh, you know uh, equation for that is to be able to understand how to put more affordable homes, uh, but also to crack the puzzle of how the city can provide development regulations to encourage builders to build more uh, affordable housing and provide them with incentives yeah. and also come up with some creative financing for those. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to take questions towards the end uh, when everybody's there. But uh, thank you for, uh, for having me and um, I look forward to the other uh, panelists. Absolutely. Dr. Saw, I appreciate you so much. As you said, this is uh, information that can go on for an hour, hour and a half, and you dialed it down to just a few minutes. So I really appreciate that. And one of the things that you mentioned that I think um, dovetails very nicely to our next speaker, Ms. Shante Patton, is um, home ownership, and that being one of the biggest wealth creators for, uh, for, for us. And so as we think about that, you know, Shante, I want to kind of pivot over to you. Um, you wear many hats, Shante, one of which is a leader in the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. I'd love for you to kind of share with us a little bit more about the purpose of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And again, something that Dr. Saul mentioned in terms of um, the path that they're taking to help create wealth through home ownership. Shante? Absolutely. Um, and I can also share some updated numbers for you on affordability and what the market looks like right now um, in Las Vegas as of September, um, which is our most recent numbers right now. One of the concerns, I mean, it's if you're a homeowner, you are in a great position right now. The prices are going up, the equity is flowing, um, and it's a great time to own a home. If you are a home buyer, um, we are starting to get into that point where we get a little concern about the affordability for first time home buyers. Um, normally, you have a balanced market. A balanced market means it's good for buyers, it's good for sellers. We all want that kind of market, but it typically shifts either to the buyer side, um, which means there's more houses than there are people to purchase, or the seller side where there are more buyers than houses to purchase. And right now we are in a strong seller's market. There are not enough houses here to, um, to take care of everyone who needs and wants to purchase a house. So typically anything less than about four to six months worth of inventory, we consider that to be a good buyer's market. Anything less or anything less than that is a good seller's market. So where we are right now is in September, we only had 4,900 houses on the market. That's, that's almost nothing because when we take into consideration, you have about 3,000 people needing homes every month, that gives you no more than about 1.4 months of inventory. Um, what happens when you have only 1.4 months of inventory are above list price offers, stretching the appraisals to the max, um, multiple offers on everything, regardless of the price range. And what we typically see is the lower price ranges where we get our introductory first time home buyers are struggling because this is a prime spot for investors too. So they are having to compete against themselves, you know, and everyone else who wants a house for the first time. And they're having to compete against investors who are finding this a prime time because interest rates are so low, you know, so we are kind of running against time to get as many first time home buyers in with lower interest rates and down payment assistance options as we possibly can. The average price range as of September was $334,832. Um, we know that that puts you right at that FHA mark, you know, so it makes it, if we go up 10,000 more, we have canceled out our first time home buyer programs under FHA. So those are things that are, are concerning right now. 72% um, of every house that was put on the market in September sold. 72%. So unless homes continue to get listed and sellers take advantage of being able to purchase up, then we've got a little bit of an issue on affordability, um, significant issues on affordability. And this is something that we will have to continue to look into in the first quarter um, because with interest rates being so low, probably the next 18 months, it, it can definitely be concerning. Now we have those buyers who are coming in and they know the market's so bad, you know, they're going to buy up all the short sales in the foreclosures. And then we have to explain to them, 
there are no short sales and foreclosures. We're not in that kind of market. So in September, out of the um, 4,911 homes that sold, only 55 of them were short sales and only 58 of them were REOs, which is foreclosed homes. You know, so those are some of the things that we continue to track and watch every year or every month to just kind of see where affordability is going. And as we see, we're on the cusp of not being able to be affordable. Um, so with that being said, um, I am the regional vice president of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. We were founded in 1947 out of the need for democracy and housing. At that time, black real estate professionals could not be members of the National Association of Realtors. We were not allowed to call ourselves Realtors. So we had to create our own association, which was the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And instead of calling ourselves Realtors, we call ourselves Realtist. Um, and so we have a national goal of 2 million new Black homeowners in the next five years. And one of the main things that we do, um, besides the times that we have to testify in front of Congress to fight for minority home ownership is we publish what is called the Sheba Report, and that's the State of Housing in Black America Report. Um, and luckily, I can share these with you because the report came out yesterday. And so where we are seeing things is one, home ownership is the key to building wealth. We have to remember, and this analogy is used quite a bit, that you need to imagine that you played a game of Monopoly and your opponent had 400 times to go around the board before you were ever even allowed to play. And that's what black home ownership is. And so we're constantly playing catch up in order to be in an equal footing. And we know how important that is because it builds wealth, it stabilizes communities, it's linked to access of education, employment opportunities, increased safety, physical and mental health, we know that it surrounds our community and it is our step to being better in our community. So currently um, our black home ownership rate on a national level is 47%. Um, we have not even reached the pre-2008 crisis levels yet. So with our home ownership rating did go up in 2019, we're at 52.1%. So we have definitely made a big push. Um, Latinx were at 47.5 and white home ownership was at 73.4. So you can see the huge gap. So although we are a little bit higher, there is still over 28 points of gap in between there. Um, one of the things that's most concerning to us is because we're just slightly lower right now than we were in 1960, and that was prior to the 1968 Fair Housing Act. So we're, we're still struggling significantly. Um, and we know that Black homeowners or Blacks population is about 13% in, um, in this country, but we make up half of the Black households in home ownership. Right now, some of the issues when it comes to age is there are low home ownership rates for younger Black um, households. And so one of the things that we are doing to kind of target that and tailor it to something else is what the president calls the house in the car. And that is our effort to put in the 1.7 million Black millennials who are mortgage ready, have incomes over $100,000, who need to purchase a home. And so we are focusing on providing them the education that they need, um, making sure that they understand that their only deterrent right now is the $700 car payment that they have. And that's the biggest deterrent. It's either the student loans, right? Or it's a car payment. And so being able to educate them that if you purchase the house, the house can pay for a car. If you purchase the house, it can pay for your lifestyle. It could pay for your travel. The house is where you have to start. And so we're putting quite a bit of time into that because right now we see that black college students um, make up 86.4% of student loan debt. And that's huge right now within our community. And 29% um, of bachelor's degrees uh, recipients who graduated without 
debt um, in a white household, but only 14% have graduated without debt in the black household. And that average 33% um, of African American who have bachelor degrees owe over $40,000 in student loan debt. And because of that, that eats up a lot of our income. It makes it difficult for us to be able to finance a home. And a lot of that comes from the fact that if our parents and our grandparents owned real estate, they could have funded a portion of college as opposed to having to get student loans. And so those are some of the things that we try to keep an eye out on. Um, so a couple other things right now when it comes to gender, our numbers of home ownership are being headed by females. And these are typically by single black females. They are, they are spending more time being educated and less time having children we have seen. So that's made a big, um, that's a big key point when it comes to getting home ownership into the black community is that black single females are willing and able and ready to purchase. So those are some of the things that we have um, been able to take into consideration. Um, although the millennial numbers are low right now for home ownership, 89% of millennials report intentions of becoming homeowners. And that falls into our campaign that is focused solely on getting them to understand the benefits of home ownership. Um, and of our households, 17% of black households have incomes over 100,000. But um, per Fannie Mae or prayer per Freddie Mac, 2.9 million black mortgage ready, there are 2.9 million black mortgage ready households in the US. So we are constantly trying to figure out then why are they not homeowners? You know, and so a lot of the issues when it comes to my to millennials is they did not grow up in a household that was taught the American dream. They grew up in a household during a recession where their families lost their homes, where they moved out of their neighborhoods, they moved away from their friends. It increased financial issues, which increased family issues and divorces. So their home ownership thoughts aren't as positive as others who grew up and that was the thing that you did. And so being able to change their mindset is another challenge that we have had in the black community. Now, when it comes to mortgages, and I'm sure there's someone on here who will be able to speak towards that, but the state of mortgage market for black borrowers currently is there were 10 lenders who were responsible for originating 24% of mortgage loans for black homeowners in 2019. The average black homeowner is between 35 and 44. So they're the older millennials like myself and they have a FICO score of roughly 626. And so we know um, for our lenders on here that if we can get them to that 646, 60, 680 mark, that's our, that's our a sweet spot. And so being able to educate them on ways to financially be able to boost your points a bit they're so close, but just not quite there. And that's where NARAP comes in with the education. We also have a program that we have um, partnered with. It's called D-Free. And it is a free program online that helps you save. It, it maps out how to pay off your debt, including student loan debt. It sends you reminders and it helps you stay on track to get there so that we can boost credit scores. Um, and then finally, 53% of Black mortgage borrowers depended on FHA or VA loans, as opposed to 23% of white buyers. So at the same time, 73.6% of white homeowners were able to get into conventional loans, which have better interest rates and, and, and less points charged to them, um, while only 45% of Black homeowners took out conventional mortgages. Now, some of the things that we are requesting um, in our public policy positions are more aggressive loan forbearance and credit reporting mandates to protect, to protect Black homeowners um, and potential, potential homeowners. We want a federal level rent relief and eviction bans. 
Um, we want to continue with the CARES Act suspension of federal student loan payments, debt collection, um, zero interest provisions through the end of the pandemic crisis, not the end of this year. Um, we are also requesting an executive order to prioritize Black home ownership. We want a revision of the Community Reinvestment Act to modernize bank requirements so that they can serve Black communities in a way that they don't currently serve them. Um, we want to create a restorative African American home ownership program similar to HUD 120 or 184, which is a Native American housing program. We want that restored and extended to Black homeowners and Black Americans. The other thing is um, there is an expansion that can be done to the Dodd-Frank Section 349 on diversity and inclusion, as well as the American Dream Down Payment Savings Plan Act. It allows tax advantages for putting money aside for down payment. And we think that things like that would be able to help us since we um, typically can afford the house, but coming up with the finances to be able to put down as a down payment can sometimes be an issue. Um, we also want to expand the low income housing tax credits. And one of the important things is requiring that opportunity zone funds be directed to long-term residents in the community versus investors. So it's a great investment opportunity for you to buy into an opportunity zones, but we want a, kind of that first right of rescission to go to the people actually living in the community so that they can invest into their own community um, and not investors. And then we would also want to establish a Renaissance neighborhood program to bolster black home ownership in historically red lined neighborhoods and start to transform our communities and um, a minority home ownership marketing outreach and assistance program where we focus our marketing dollars specifically on bringing knowledge to African Americans on the importance of home ownership, making sure that we are inclusive in our advertisement, that we're using minority photos and everything so that they can feel inclusive that this American dream is for them as well. And then finally, I just wanna end with some of the great things right now to combat affordable housing is purchasing multiplexes. So we have been pushing for first time homeowners to purchase multiplexes in order to be able to get in as a homeowner and an investor at the same time. So FHA okay. allows you, uh, yeah. Real quick, I'm so sorry to, to uh, cut you short there. I don't mean to cut you off, um, but there's so many things that you mentioned and I also wanna make sure to get to uh, some of the things that you mentioned before related to awareness around down payment assistance. And we have some great speakers on that as well. But I do want to say this, I want to commend NABRA for the work that they're doing for all communities, including uh, shining a light on the African American community and helping to build wealth and grow wealth. And the thing that you mentioned in terms of what they're doing, the fact that they can be found um, in that SHIBA report, I'd love for you to maybe put in that chat uh, section, if you haven't already, you know, where to find the SHIBA report for folks that maybe want to learn more about NARAB and, and the things that you've talked about here. So thank you so much. Um, no, sorry to cut you off, but also again want to want to make sure to get to um, one of our next speakers who's done a fantastic job with the work that she's done at Nevada Housing Division, Ms. Nia Germa. And again, Shantae's mentioned this before. Uh, Dr. Saul mentioned this related to down payment assistance programs and helping those who are first-time home buyers. Nia, I'd love to turn it over to you to talk a little bit more about what the work uh, the work that you all are doing at the Nevada Housing Division. Of course, thank you, Alvin. Good afternoon, everybody, and I, I love participating in these just because the information that's shared and the resources um, are outstanding. So I'm, I'm as much as a student as I am a presenter today. Um, I always swell with pride, um, not only with my um, my employment with the Nevada Housing Division allows for me to have an active participating role in NAREB as well. So uh, everything that Shante mentioned just gives me uh, an additional sense of pride. Um, but over to Nevada Housing Division. I don't know if you heard um, Alvin mentioned during um, my bio, but my, um, my undergraduate, my bachelor's degree is in psychology. So a lot of people ask me how I sort of ended up in housing. Um, but if you've done any study in psychology, one of our, our pillars of psychology is Abraham Maslow, who created a, um, a hierarchy, a pyramid of needs. And before you can address anything psychologically or mentally dealing with the person and their needs, their esteem, their, their uh, love. The first thing is our physiological needs, which are food and shelter. So I like to, 
to think that I am helping with the basic needs of um, all of our Nevada constituents psychologically and um, helping to ensure that we have affordable housing for all. So as you can see with um, Nevada Housing Division, we do quite a few things, but I'm gonna focus today on our home buyer program. Um, what we do with Home is Possible, we can sum it up in four separate programs. They're all under the window of, I'm sorry, under the umbrella of Home is Possible. We have our standard DPA, uh, which offers up to 5% of the total loan amount with a cap of $20,000 towards down payment and closing costs. Those are available for all borrowers who qualify for financial, for mortgage loan servicing here in Nevada to purchase a home as their primary residence. So um, as um, it was mentioned, we do have a, a huge migration of people coming from other states, uh, Arizona and California. We get the call a lot. Um, you don't have to be a Nevada resident. So we don't have any season requirement. You just have to be willing to become a Nevada resident and have a home in Nevada as your primary residence where you are working and establishing um, yourself in the community. Um, we also have our HIP program for a HIP program for heroes. It's an attractive below market interest rate that we offer to all of our VA uh, financing borrowers. So all borrowers who qualify for VA financing, we have a very strong alliance with the Nevada um, Department of Nevada Veteran Services here. Um, so making sure that all of the um, all of the um, those military families that are relocating to Nevada um, know that we are working and striving to become one of the most uh, military friendly family um, states in the nation. Um, so just a few stats with some of our programs after this, um, our home is possible, um, our standard home is possible and total cumulative since the inception of our program has been able to help close to 25,000 home buyers. And I don't like to look at it as, as numbers and loans, but those are 25,000 um, families who have now been able to achieve that dream of home ownership and began to create a stability and um, generational wealth for their families. In addition to that, for our for Heroes program, we've been able to help 1,600 veteran families purchase a home here in Nevada. Um, one that's near and dear to our hearts is our HIP for teach Teachers program. This one is a below market, uh, attractive um, fixed rate. I believe today the interest rate for this program was 2.75%. It provides a first uh, mortgage of 2.75% uh, as well as $7,500 in DPA funds for any Nevada public school teacher that's anywhere in the state of Nevada, um, as long as they are K through 12 classroom teacher. Our belief for this program is that we are helping to um, diversify the um, occupations here in Nevada by providing quality health care. We can um, seek to provide the, you know, uh, make this a hub for tech centers and, and other sorts of occupations. But if the education piece is not here, um, corporations will not move here. So this is the Nevada um, Housing Division's piece to help improve, uh, improve the education system here in Nevada. And then we also have our HIP for first time home buyers, which offers 2% of the total loan amount for government finance first time home buyers and all of these programs available are available statewide. We have no geographical restrictions. Um, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have any more slides. <laughs> that's, my, um, that's my contact information. Um, but what I do want to provide about Nevada, um, our, our, our home buyer programs is that we are quite proud of the numbers. As I mentioned this year, we're close to 3000 home buyers that we've been able to help purchase a home just here in this year. Um, but in beyond our, our using our programs, what our goal is to is to increase home buyers and home ownership throughout the state of Nevada, whether that's through utilization of our programs or not. So we've um, shifted our focus slightly to make sure that we have expanded our outreach and collaboration efforts with all of our nonprofit organizations that offer down payment assistance, as well as all of the organizations here in the state that offer education. And we've beefed up our financial literacy program to make sure that we are helping home buyers be able to achieve and sustain home ownership. Um, I know that we have lots of uh, other panelists to get to and there's so much information. So I've um, please jot down our website as well as my email and my contact information. If you have any um, specific questions about our program, we're available. Um, we, our program has not ended. It is um, available ongoing through a, a public-private partnership. We do not run out of funding um, despite COVID and we've actually seen some increase in home buyers and residents here in Nevada who are looking to create stability for their, themselves beyond the, the reach that we spoke, um, that Shante spoke of, of extending home 
um, wealth through home ownership. People are looking for stability. Um, rents have steadily increased, but we are quite proud of the fact that our programs offer a fixed rate mortgage so that your mortgage will not increase um, despite how volatile the market can be right now in, in uncertain times. So um, I will be happy to answer any questions after all of the other panelists have presented, but that is, um, that is what I have for today. Thank you, Alvin. Wendy, I really appreciate it. And um, I think this is the most important slide, right? Because what you said is uh, a number of homes and excuse me, households and families that you've been able to help um, as it relates to um, the dream of home ownership coming close to them. So uh, for those in the audience, please jot down the information. We want to overwhelm Nia <laughs> with this information because you have access. To and these just one other thing, buyers. we are close to helping our 1,000th teacher um, get into a home as well. So quite some significant progress being made. Amazing, amazing. Well, thank you so much, Nia. And in, 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 the, in the spirit of mentioning overwhelming, I want to make sure to overwhelm our next speaker too, Ms. Diane Arvizo. You know, Diane um, does similar work in terms of making sure that home ownership is closer to, to families and, and sooner than, than, than they may think. So Diane, let me, let me turn it over to you so you can also provide your information on your programs, your, your content information, so we can overwhelm you with families that may want to um, uh, have the dream of home ownership. Diane? Thank you, Alvin. I love to be overwhelmed. And Nia, great job. I'm just so excited. Um, Alvin, I just got to tell you, thank you for the introduction. And to sit here with these panelists, man, they're, they're smart brains. It's so awesome. I'm so excited already with the information that I've heard. I can't wait till we get to some discussions. This roundtable is going to be really great. Um, you know, kind of one of my favorite quotes is from Laura Ingalls Wilder. Kind of people makes people chuckle, but home is the nicest word there is. It's one of my favorite quotes. And uh, it really kind of resonates with us, you know, here at Nevada Rural Housing, I work with the Home at Last program, uh, which is uh, a home ownership program, as you all know, we provide down payment assistance and we provide a mortgage credit certificate program. I feel very fortunate in my role here at Nevada Rural Housing Authority that in the Home at Last program, we get to see people get home every day. And oftentimes our team will actually get up and celebrate, like literally we'll get up, do a little jiggy dance and we'll celebrate because we see sometimes the work that goes into how hard it is to maybe make just one deal get closed. And I know John Roussel here on the panel uh, has gotten up out of his chair and celebrated with us on a few of those transactions. And it, a lot of work goes into not only helping people bridge the gap to home ownership, but to actually get to the point of celebration. And I know when we talk about our mission here at Nevada Rural Housing Authority, which is, Bill Brewer, you'll love this, to promote, provide, and finance affordable housing opportunities for all rural Nevadans. We like to remember when we're sitting here thinking about housing policy, what programs to offer, uh, what kind of assistance people might need to bridge gaps or to break down barriers that there is a face behind every name. And it's really important that we consider that. Um, but, you know, we've got the jurisdiction at Nevada Rural Housing is, is definitely something that you could consider a barrier. But in Nevada, man, we're a rural state. So we serve about uh, the whole state except for Las Vegas and Reno. So we're all over and, and Nia, man, high five girl. Woo! We are doing it together. We're like the sister agencies. And uh, we basically, our jurisdiction is everywhere that's under 150,000 population. So down in Las Vegas, man, we're talking Summerlin South, we're talking Enterprise and Whitney and people are like, woo, their minds blown when we think about everywhere we serve. And we do a lot of things in partnership with Nevada Housing Division. For example, we have a mortgage credit certificate program. Really important to understand how that single program can help with affordable home ownership, which I'll get into in a minute. And then of course, up in the North, John Roussel will be um, excited to hear and, and have me shout out that Sparks and Spanish Springs and Washoe Valley and all those areas within Washoe County are also eligible for the Nevada Rural Program. Everywhere else in Nevada is 100% eligible. So this really is a Nevada Rural Home at Last State where we can make down payment assistance um, open up the door to affordable home ownership for a lot of rural Nevadans. When we talk about Nia's uh, stats with Nevada Housing Division, it really warms our heart because, again, there are 
faces behind every one of those numbers. It is life changing. 1,000 teachers, I mean, give it up. It's amazing. The veterans, I mean, it's just incredible. At Nevada Rural Housing, where we're the tiny agency, we're the little local, we're like the the in the back pocket. Um, we've just we've already done 1,100 home buyers just this year in the first nine months. I mean that is incredible, and we're in the middle of a pandemic. Who would have thought? This is insane. Um, we're just about to bust our 10,000th um, home buyer home closing with our Home at Last program. Um, it's, it's incredible. We've done 1.9 billion in home mortgages. Uh, we've done 54 million in down payment assistance. Um, through our mortgage credit certificate program, we've helped home buyers receive about 28 million in estimated tax savings. That's money that actually goes back to the home buyer to then spend in the local economies. That helps local economies thrive. Um, that mortgage credit certificate, I wanna tell you about that real quick because we don't hear a lot about that. We hear a ton about down payment assistance. We don't hear a lot about the mortgage credit certificate. The mortgage credit certificate, which I'll call the MCC, it gives home buyers 20 to 50% of the mortgage interest that they pay refunded to them in the form of, of a tax credit every year. What does that mean to the home buyer? It means long-term sustainable home ownership. They're gonna to get to claim that tax credit every year that they live in the home as a primary residence. At the time that they buy the home, it means that the estimated tax credit can be treated as additional qualifying income. That's the one time you can say, thank you IRS, because it's the real deal. That means they can purchase maybe the home in the right neighborhood where the school is located for their kids maybe the home with the extra bedroom that they couldn't afford without the MCC. So we really rely on our home at last lenders who actually deliver the program to know about these programs. So education is really key and we're gonna talk about that in a minute as well. So when we talk about accessing affordable credit, what does that mean? Where do we begin? It means definitely it starts with education. It means working with partners who understand like Shantae, man, great education. We cannot get enough education out on the street to our partners, to our home buyers. How do we do that? We work together, we collaborate together, we work with the industry professionals who are dedicated to their profession, who want to work together to make sure home buyers have access uh, to the most affordable credit possible. One thing that a lot of people don't realize that we do here at Nevada Rural Housing through our Home at Last program is we want to make sure that people who are buying a home now and also who already own a home have access to affordable credit no matter whether they are buying or already own a home. So we have a refinance option for them. They can refinance into the program. Our rate right now today, if you were to pull up our rates and I'll drop those links into the chat box so Christine won't have to remind me. And uh, it's 2.25% today for government loans. That's FHA, VA, and USDA. What's the minimum FICO for those borrowers? to get into that program with a 2.25% rate. What do you think? 640, mm -hmm. 640 and they get a 2.25% rate if they meet all the other qualifications. Income, government loans, 116,000 maximum income. Conventional loans, it's a little higher, 2.75% rate. We go up to 135,000 on the income. That is unique to the Home at Last program. I'm gonna drop those resource links into the chat box. I do want to let you know that we, we call the how the Home at Last program HAL. Uh, we like to refer to it as HAL, kind of because maybe we have a pet adoption program. HAL is a cool name to name a dog, right? So it's also a great way to remember the program. So when you go back to your local community, people are asking you about, I want to buy a home, or how can I get into affordable home ownership? Or I know someone who wants to buy a home, where should they begin? Just remember HAL or remember Nevada Rural Housing, or remember Nevada Housing Division. We all work together. We want to make sure they get into affordable home ownership. Now, we're going to talk about education, but I'm going to let our awesome moderator get to that question uh, later on in the panel. So I'm going to say thank you very much for having me today, and I look forward to hearing more information to come. Thanks, Alvin. Thank you so much. And Diane, you know, the first thing that comes to mind for me uh, is energy. I just thank you so much for your energy and I think it shows your passion through 
And so, uh, like we said before with me, in terms of overwhelming somebody, again, guys, we want you to overwhelm Diane with your questions, use the chat with that, but also overwhelm her with those folks who you have access to that maybe you're looking for home ownership and get those folks in contact with Diane because she's an advocate and ally for um, those folks who are in our rural areas. And so we really love and appreciate that. Um, Diane mentioned something that's very important related to affordable home ownership. And we've had a few of again for down payment assistance providers speak. I'd like to transition to uh, another another provider of ours and a friend of ours, Ms. Iris Tam Bailey. Um, Iris, if if you don't mind, we'd love to 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 hear from you as well. Um, there's some great tools, resources that uh, Nia has touched on, that Diane has touched on, uh, but also I know at the Federal Home Loan Bank San Francisco, there are things that you are doing as well for those future first and home buyers and those folks with uh, low and moderate income. So. Um, Iris, if you don't mind, I'd love to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Alvin. Good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, my name is Iris. I'm with the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. Uh, looks like I might be the last panelist today, but uh, if I were last, certainly not least. Anyway, <laughs> before I share information about bank payment assistance programs that we offer, I'd like to just give a, a brief background about the Federal Home Loan Bank. Next slide. The Federal Home Loan Bank system, in case you don't already know, was chartered by Congress about 88 years ago as a funding resource to help support home mortgage lenders. Lending institutions often use Federal Home Loan Banks to finance their housing and economic development activities in their local communities. We are a government sponsored enterprise and are regulated uh, by the Federal Housing Finance Agency. There are a total of 11 federal home loan banks nationwide. Next slide. The Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco is a members cooperative. We are owned by our member financial institutions that are headquartered in the tri-state district of Arizona, California, and Nevada. Our members include um, different types of financial institutions, commercial banks, uh, community banks, credit unions, savings institutions, insurance companies, and also non-depository CDFIs. Next slide. So while we are a privately held organization, we do have a public service mission. And it is because of that public service mission, we provide a variety of grant programs, products, services to benefit our member institutions and in turn support and benefit the communities that they serve. Some of you in the audience might already be familiar with our AHP program, which provides and creates affordable housing and affordable home ownerships. Our AHEAD program and quality jobs funds program provide or create and support uh, economic developments, as well as disaster relief, uh, wildfires, uh, COVID pandemic and all. Next slide. Through our partnership with participating member institutions, the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco offers two down payment assistance programs, WISH and IDEA. Both of them are targeted at first time home buyers that are income eligible. These grant programs can offer up to $22,000 per household per transaction to be used for down payment and closing costs. It's a four to one match program, meaning that if a home buyer wants to get that 40, excuse me, wants to get that 22,000, then they would need to contribute a minimum of $5,500 into the transaction. But we don't have a minimum amount. So in an example of a home buyer contributing, let's say $4,000, that's okay. We can match four times of that or up to $16,000. The WISH program are targeted at 
folks that are ready to transition from renting to owning. While our IDEA program are targeted at folks that um, may not have their down payment ready, may not have cash saved for the transaction. So in order to participate in the IDEA program, these home buyers will participate and save in one of the three dedicated savings program, either in an IDA or an individual development account, uh, usually hosted by a financial institution or a nonprofit organization, or a family self-sufficiency or FSS account, usually hosted by the local housing authority, or finally, a lease to own program that is administered by either a nonprofit or a governmental entity. Next slide. Here is a quick comparison, uh, a screenshot of how Wish and Idea are similar and how are they different. Both Wish and Idea have the same income eligibility requirement. The household must not earn greater than 80% of area median income or, A, or AMI. They need to complete a home buying counseling or an education program. We have a five year retention period. And as I mentioned, the grants are matching grants. So we do a four to one match up to $22,000. They have to be a first time home buyer and that's the same definition as HUD's first time home buyer. And the household will be qualified and confirm uh, their eligibility at the time of enrollment to the program. How they are different is that the WISH program, generally we see the participants um, are home buying ready, a down payment ready, um, maybe also mortgage ready, credit score ready, as such that we allow them up to one year time from the time that they are enrolled into the WISH program to the time that they identify a home and enter into escrow to purchase. The IDEA program, most of the participants in this programs don't have their cash down payment and usually tend to be not mortgage ready or not credit score ready. Because they don't have the down payment, they don't have that cash to contribute, they need to participate in one of the three savings programs that I have mentioned. And there has a mandatory savings component. And because they need time to save for their down payment, and they might also need time to get their credit score in order and get themselves mortgage ready. We allow them up to five years from the time of enrollment into the program to when they identify a home and open escrow. Next slide. So this slide and the next slide as well um, my most favorite slide of my whole presentation. Here, we tell a story about a hardworking family, a first time home buyer, a low income home buyer, how through hard work, they were able to realize their American dream and purchase their first home with the support of a wish grant. I myself spend most of my time, uh, most of my work time in front of a computer, uh, reviewing documents, checking compliance, checking eligibility, checking data, making sure everything is accurate. But when I look at these pictures, next slide please. And I see the beautiful smiles on this great family and how they achieve their American dream. It helps to remind me that our work that we do definitely matter. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Iris. Uh, the work that we do definitely matters and you brought up so many great things. We really appreciate it. We wanna overwhelm you <laughs> as well. We wanna make sure that we can help folks become closer to, to owning a home. And, and we did have one more speaker. So, so you, weren't, you, you, weren't, you weren't last, you're definitely not least, but I do wanna do this. Uh, John, what a great friend. I hope this doesn't impact our friendship by any means, <laughs> but I, I wanna give you just, just one, or two, one or two minutes just to talk about from a lender perspective. Um, all these programs and products that our speakers have talked about, oftentimes, um, how do we get folks ready for home ownership? You're a lender, you've been putting folks in homes for a quarter of a century, we thank you for that. Uh, we've heard about education, heard about FICO, we've heard about credit, you know, are those things important? And again, I only got, got one minute for you, my friend, but I, I think from a lender perspective, it, it's great, great to hear uh, from you and anything that you wanna kind of close us out with uh, before we turn it back over to Christine and maybe take one more poll question before we head out, so. John, thanks for your patience. I'll turn it over to you. You may be on mute, John. You may want to star six, maybe. That, and that a little bit better? That's, that's it. All right, there we go. First of all, wonderful, uh, wonderful panel, wonderful discussion. Um, you know, as a lender, you guys provide me with so many different tools that allow me to achieve the goals of getting unlimited families into houses. Uh, the only thing that uh, I'm learning through this panel is I need to do a little bit better um, job at the education of opportunity, right? I, I would love to be able to sit down and talk with as many people as I humanly can to tell them all of the steps that they need to go through in order to do successful home ownership. So, Sounds like I better uh, get out there and do some more meetings. You guys are doing a great job. You provide us with wonderful services uh, that really, really help us get a lot of families into homes. So thank you and keep up the great work. John, thank you so much. And you're doing more than you know, my friend. <laughs> so thank you for being humble, but we really truly appreciate all that you do and the education that you do provide for your homeowners because I know that you believe, like all of us believe, it's not just about getting a home. It's about sustainable home ownership, and I think that's what you do with ISERV. So thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Uh, Christine, no problem at all. I know that we wanted to capture at least one piece of information from, from our poll question. We want to make sure that folks, first and foremost, put your questions in the chat. We'll try and um, um, answer those maybe, maybe after this. But Christine, let me turn it over to you. I know we got a session on our heels, so I want to be respectful of their time uh, for maybe our last poll question. Yeah, thanks, Alvin, and wow. Such awesome uh, information. Iris, I did ask you a question in the chat and I see a couple other uh, questions in the chat. Um, if the panelists can get to those. Uh, our next session start at 2.30, but I would love if you can take your smartphone and just respond here because we don't have a ton of time for questions, but this helps the coalition. All of these responses really help us to understand do we need to have, and definitely we do, a half day workshop on home ownership programs, tools, and the policies that we need to help, you know, to uh, really promote uh, affordable home ownership for more Nevadans. So I would love to hear your feedback if you can just put your phone up there one more time. Uh, it's not a word cloud, so you're not uh, stuck on just one or two words. But what tools or solutions are you most interested in from this session that you think or were surprised about, like we should be using more here in Nevada? Additionally, we'll just ask one question. If there's something you didn't hear about today or you have a question, pop it in here because that will also impact our future uh, convenings and the information that we can bring to you. But panelists, it was amazing. We have a lot of great programs. My stepdaughter's a teacher and she's been asking me about the home ownership program, Mia. So I definitely got a little more uh, information for her. Oh, and Shantae, yeah, you partner, excellent. We'll probably be in touch. <laughs> so go this ahead and pop your hear. questions in the here or in the chat and I'll turn it back to you, Alvin. No, that, that's all I wanted to say is I, I know folks, um, you know, oftentimes that technology can, can, can be a hurdle for us. So I was going to say, hey, if it's okay to use that chat, that's just great feedback from the Nevada Housing Coalition. So we can make sure to um, not only answer your questions, but understand what you want to hear about and how we should maybe facilitate an environment um, so that you can hear what you want to learn more about. 
other than that, I just really want to, again, thank our panelists uh, for the time that they took today. I want to thank all of our, our audience members for taking the time um, as well. You know, the goal of this panel was first and foremost to provide awareness and to provide education. I, I really hope and feel that this is valuable to you, uh, that you, you walked away uh, knowing a bit more uh, than when you came in, um, having the content information of some, some great resources and panelists. Uh, Dr. Saw, I do want to thank you one more time just for the research that you've done, kind of setting the stage in terms of where we're at. So thank you for that. And, and again, you know, this information is, is out, out, out here for you. The Nevada Housing Coalition will ensure that, uh, that you have the presentation um, after we, we wrap up here. But um, all in all, I just want to thank everyone. That's a great first step to, again, helping more folks recognize the dream of home ownership and at the very same time, helping towards building wealth. And we all play a part in that. And so I thank you all, Christine. I think I want to be respectful of our, of our panel that, that's coming in. And so uh, I'll, I'll cut it off right there. And uh, thank you all again. I appreciate it.